Welcome to the Curious Advantage podcast, an exploration of the idea of curiosity and its increasing importance for thriving in the digital age from the authors of The Curious Advantage. Hello, and welcome to this episode of The Curious Advantage podcast. This series is about how individuals and organizations use the power of curiosity to drive success in their lives, especially in the context of our new digital reality. It brings to life the latest understanding from neuroscience, anthropology, history and behaviorism about curiosity and makes these useful for everyone. My name is Simon Brown. I'm one of the co-authors of the book, The Curious Advantage, and the Chief Learning Officer at Novartis. And today I'm here with my co-author, Paul Ashcroft. Hi. And we're delighted to be joined by Stefan Van Hoedink, Global Chief Learning Officer at Cognizant. Hello. Welcome to The Curious Advantage, Stefan. Thanks for having me. So, Stefan, you have a distinguished career in the learning world. You've held leadership roles in a range of major companies, such as uh, Philips, uh, Saudi Aramco, and now Cognizant. Uh, And also in your most recent role, you've been involved in something you call curiosity re-engineering, and we'll come to that shortly. Uh, Firstly, though, please can you tell us a little bit about Cognizant as a company and your role there as COO? Thank you, Simon. Cognizant is a big company, 300,000 people. And the company was also in a big transition where the company was focusing more on buying resources um, until about two years ago. And that balance moved in favor of uh, bringing a balance between buying and building resources. Of course, there's a huge amount of transformation that needs to happen if such a big organization wants to uh, wants to change towards that. And there's a huge role, of course, for learning to play out. The reason why this change happened was especially in the forefront of technology, because that's where Cognizant is playing, for the forefront of technology like IoT, like digital engineering, like artificial intelligence in those areas. There's just not enough people out there in the street to recruit. So we had to start focusing on developing people much more than ever before. And that's where, that's the time I joined. So, uh, and it was a, a beautiful roller coaster uh, where we tried all kind of different, different uh, programs and different things to, to energize everybody. An amazing place to be, I guess, where you're a, a tech company where uh, skills are moving faster and faster, probably the, one of the fastest areas of anywhere at the moment. And then also going from that buy to build uh, means it must be an exciting place to be for learning. It is fabulous. It's amazing uh, how much uh, also, if you're looking at the demographic that we're dealing with inside the company, we're talking about young people, people that are basically naturally curious. It's more about give, giving them wings rather than uh, just teaching them stuff or, or making them train type of thing. No, it's, it's all about enabling rather than spoon feeding. Stefan, you mentioned curiosity there. I know that it's been something that you've been really focusing on in the past few years. Can we talk a little bit about curiosity first? What's your definition of curiosity? For me, curiosity is openness to the world to others and to myself. Openness, you you can just general openness to the world, i.e. I'm interested in the world around me, to people uh, or others. I'm interested in the people around me in an organizational context. Wouldn't it be nice if I know everything about my neighbor or that I know as many people as possible in the organization? And the third dimension, curiosity about myself, is all about how much am I aware of my deeper drivers, how much am I aware of my own values, of the things that tick me, including my limiting beliefs type of thing. So I'm a great believer that if you were able to focus on those two dimensions of curiosity, then magic will happen. Love that definition, the openness to the world, to others and myself. Is in some of the, the research that we were doing, we're seeing how curiosity actually helps in reducing conflicts within teams because it makes you curious to others, others' points of view, and also actually how it increases and improves communication because you're curious to be a better listener and to it can actually sort of help you in various ways. So yeah, I really like your definition there. You were just talking earlier about how cognizance being on a journey from buying to building capability and talent. What role has curiosity played in this journey at Cognizant? When you're looking at learning, typically what learning organizations or learning teams are focusing on is what I call primary and secondary skills. Primary skills are the skills that you need to have 
for doing a job. Uh, and in our case, very often it's technology skills, it's computer skills, it's computer language and those type of things. Secondary skills are typically the skills that help you be a professional. And that's the thing around collaboration, around uh, creative thinking and those type of things. But often we in learning and development are stopping there. And I think curiosity was an opportunity for us to move into the third area of, of skills, which, which you could call tertiary skills, or I call them meta skills, which is creating deeper habits with people. Because at the end of the day, and especially in the area of IT, but I can imagine also pretty much anywhere, that the tricks of the past in our fast-growing environments are not always going to help us towards the future. So instead of teaching people knowledge, which is always historic, there maybe there's an opportunity to teach people habits so they get on with things themselves. So they can learn themselves, they can find themselves things, they can ask the right questions. So it's not any more about problem solving, it's about problem finding. You need a different mindset. That mindset for me is the meta skills. And that's where curiosity and growth mindsets and learn to learn were so important as a combination to drive this. So basically, I wanted to create an environment where the learning and development organization could set up a platform and basically get out of the way. Because the more people are curious, the more they don't need learning and development to help them with the fundamental things in their careers. You're using curiosity as helping people take their learning to the next level. But in some ways, you're saying that actually, if you have curiosity in place, how much do you need programmatic learning? Is that right? Basically, there's a definition, there's a confusion in a lot of companies. What is learning and what is training? Training departments have been always been focusing on training. And although about 20 years ago, we and L&D decided to change the word training into learning, we still pretty much do train. But people learn all the time. So if you can really focus on building that learning skill with people through curiosity, through growth mindset and the likes, then basically people don't need the old-fashioned training as much, and that unleashes a lot of power. And maybe that links to another belief I have. You always have people in your organizations that are natural learners, people that are asking always the right questions, reading the right books, are part of the right networks, and they just get on with life. And you don't need to put them in any class. And then you have the B players, people that want to learn, but somehow miss something. Uh, And they need some electricity, they need a manager to interfere, they need something to be jolted. And then you have the C players, that's, that's an entire different ball game altogether. For me, always was the exercise was how do we move those B players? Because let's assume you have about 15, 20% A players and about uh, and the majority of B players. How do you make sure that those B players become A players? Because in, in my world, in Cognizant, the world is moving just too fast for to constantly be giving knowledge to people. I need to create an environment where people are naturally drawn to that knowledge themselves because I'll always be be lagging with the thousands and thousands of computer languages, for instance, that are out there and are being invented every day. I need to create an environment where people are naturally curious to go after this themselves and give them the mindset and the drivers because very often, and I think it's a challenge that we're having in a number of companies, very often we're telling people Thy shall be a self-propelled learner. But in fact, a lot of us were never taught on how to be actually the self-propelled learner or the self-propelled uh, professional. Um, and we need to give people some handles and some tools uh, to actually do this. There's quite a few pieces to create that, um, if you like, the natural learner that you described. So part of it is the the learning how to learn, which may seem straightforward, but actually many of us have, have not been learning uh, all the time and actually getting back into the habit of learning takes conscious effort. I know when we had uh, my boss, Stephen Bartley, C8, uh, Chief People and Organization Officer at Novartis, he talked about how he'd got out of the habit of learning and actually needed to consciously get back into it. Uh, and once he had, then got the buzz from ongoing learning, but it took real effort to relearn how to learn. So I think that's one element, but also then the culture that supports people to learn. How have you handled that at Cognizant to create that sort of encouragement and that, um, whether it's the space or the the sort of time for people to be able to invest in learning and um, be able to to build their skills and, and ideally become that natural learner? 
Well, I think very early on when we started, we changed our cultural tenets and our learning cultural tenets. And we, we created a big campaign, which we called Open Wonder Learn, to encourage people to be really exactly those, open, wonder, and learn. And we bombarded this notion in the entire organization in a very positive light. And we also democratized all the licenses that we had. Like Novartis and many big companies, we had a lot of online libraries and we have books and we have e-coaching platforms. And, and what we found is that sometimes some divisions had been buying licenses and were keeping them within themselves. And we had different tools for different teams that we said, we're going to democratize all of this and everybody can have access to it. all the different tools that we have. Even if it's not part of your day-to-day -day role, if you're aspiring to, for instance, learn about IoT, but you're not part of the IoT team, be our guest. Go and learn. And here are all the tools and you can get all the certifications you want type of thing. So you're all supported by the Open Wonder Learn tenant. And also, I think what is very important, we spend a lot of energy on data and convincing the organization through analytics and management layers and also the, the, the employees themselves that actually it actually led to a lot of positive magic. You developed something that you call curiosity re-engineering. So maybe you can tell us a bit more around uh, what that is. It's easy to talk about it, but how do you change habits? And we've all learned from NLP and other areas that actually there, is, there are opportunities for, for people to change their habits. What we did with Curiosity Reengineering is to create a number of very engaging and interactive 45-minute uh, sessions, online sessions, where we had trainers all around the world, people from within our team who would do those sessions. And those sessions were about curiosity, were about growth mindset, fixed mindset, also learn to learn. And the entire objective of those sessions was basically – to give people what I call language. If people have never heard growth and mindset in the same combination, they're not going to reflect on whether they have a growth mindset, yes or no. And, and I'm a great believer, and maybe that's my NLP, uh, my NLP training, the moment people have language, the moment people have words, they're able to reflect. And reflection is the starting point for making a decision. Am I happy with the status quo or uh, do I want to change? And um, so th that's exactly what we did. So we did a lot of these short sessions that we trained by now. We did, I think, more than 15,000 people. We actually giving people those, those ideas and that gives the opportunity for people to reflect. And actually we find that about 50% of the people that we have trained and we check, we're big on data. So after three months, we're checking in with those colleagues and saying, did it change? What did you pick up? Are you now more curious? Are you now more interested in the world, others, and yourself? We're finding that actually 50% of those people have actually taken a positive, have reflected on it, and have taken a positive decision to do something about it. That's what I call re-engineering, like give people ideas and re-engineering their habits towards becoming more curious and therefore becoming more like A players. Introduce people to the concept of learning how to learn, the concept around growth mindset and, and curiosity, why it's so important, and then pointing them in the direction of how they can do something about it um, out of the session. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And it's very much treating people like adults, giving people those words and say, okay, now you're an adult, you reflect on it, and I'm not going to pamper you, but be our guest. And it's amazing how much this is people giving wings. You're listening to The Curious Advantage podcast, inspired by the book The Curious Advantage, written by Paul Ashcroft, Simon Brown, and Garrick Jones. Subscribe to the podcast today. Stefan, how did people react to that, could I ask? And we talk in our book about language. And if, if as you, exactly as you say, if, if we don't have the language for something, we can't even visualize it, can't understand it, can't see it, don't know what to do with it. When you're working with people in, in this kind of way and you're introducing them to maybe quite strange territory, what has been some of the reactions that you've seen? Extremely positive. Now we're working with a, you could call it an oil patch uh, approach. We're never mandating this to anybody. We're inviting people. It's free to come. Word of mouth is leading that more and more, and more people want to join. I'm only hearing positive feedback from people. It's opening their eyes. It's opening their minds. It's it's giving them an opportunity to change their habits. They're thankful for this. Just looking at really old-fashioned learning our data. Yep. We're finding that the people that 
uh, a year prior to taking those sessions, people had about 25 hours of formal learning. We have many other learning opportunities, but let's call them formal learning for, for a second. Yeah. 25 hours. And if we're checking the learning hours post those sessions, we're at 43 hours. Mm -hmm. for just the people that follow those sessions. And then, of course, we're going deeper and we're slicing and dicing in many other ways. So it's not only what people tell us, but it's also what the habits that people display post-receiving those re-engineering sessions. Great to see that level of increase. And uh, learning hours is an interesting one because uh, on one hand, you can argue actually you know, time spent learning in itself is, is meaningless because it's all about actually have you learned anything and, and are you able to apply it? Um, but someone used a, a story recently that hit home for me, which is it's like on the airlines. You count up how many passengers uh, were on the airline. That if you've got no passengers, you're making no money. If you've got passengers on the in, in the plane, then you should be making money of all of your other metrics around operations and everything are there. And it's the same with learning hours. If people aren't spending time learning, they're not going to be learning anything. Just because they're spending time doesn't mean that they are learning but if you've got great learning content aligned to your strategic goals then actually the fact that they're spending time learning should be resulting in them getting building their skills and, and being able to apply those in a meaningful way so i think in that context learning hours is a very helpful metric and seeing that increase must be very powerful for you yeah uh, you're, you're right it's, it's just one of the many uh, drivers for for analytics that you can take but at least just on a formal learning piece, we saw a big, a big change. And uh... let's stay on data for a moment because I know you've you've done some some great work around correlating your learning data with some other uh, HR metrics like retention, attrition. Can you tell us a, a bit more around some of the work that you've been doing there? I think data is really important, not only with Cognizant, but in my, my last, I think, couple of jobs with Philips and with Flipkart and before this. I, I always have a marketing team, I always have an R&D team, and I always um, have an analytics team. And because I think these are the really important ingredients to drive towards the future. With regards to the analytics team, it's all about being Sherlock, Sherlock Holmes, and looking for data because all of us in all the companies that we have around the world, there's so much data available but what you do with the data is often a, a challenge. So when you have an analytics team, they can kind of roll up their sleeves and do all kind of that stuff. Now, you can talk about just the L&D uh, data themselves, or you can actually mirror those data against your HR data, your engagement data, your, your sales data, your customer satisfaction data, and so on and so forth. And, and I think that's where the power is of, of data. What we found early on was that there's a clear correlation between learning hours and attrition. Mm -hmm. Again, on the formal learning side, how much, how many hours people are learning is an indicator of how long they stay with the company. And also inversely, if people don't do any learning, it's probably a good indicator that they're going to leave the company. If you can bring down the attrition for, uh, for your organization by focusing on learning, which wasn't really an intuitive muscle in the company while we were focusing on the on buying people more than building people but we could prove that actually learning had a beautiful stance there's a lot of research out there around learning being either the number one or one of the top reasons that people would choose to join a company and similarly that it's one of the top or if not the top reason that if it's not there people will leave the company so your data is is backing that up but it, as you say, when you do the business case on it, it's hugely powerful because if by increasing the amount of learning that people are doing, you're reducing attrition, there's there's some huge numbers for large organizations behind the cost of that attrition and the having vacant roles and then the cost of fi finding people and potentially the hiring fees and things that go into that as well. Um, yeah, the, often the learning budget would probably be dwarfed by the cost of that uh, attrition, which creates a very strong case for learning professionals to then make the case for uh, potentially additional funding if they can show that correlation through to attrition. We did another case where we found out that actually what I call the shadow of a manager. If a manager learns a lot, the team will learn a lot. If a manager learns little, the team will learn little. We did this survey, this analysis, and we found that actually the manager has a huge shadow in terms of creating a mini culture within their own team. If they're learning a lot, magic happens. If they're not learning a lot, 
nobody touches, apart from the A players in those teams. It doesn't go fully. If, if you have an A player, you don't need a manager to learn. Yes. Uh, they'll still get on with things themselves. But for all the B players and also the C players, they need that reinforcement, that support, that role modeling of those managers. That's really interesting because we, we talk about how to be a curious leader in the book and we cite the example from Novartis where we looked at the data between engagement within a team across um, multiple dimensions, including their their curiosity um, and learning. And we looked at the difference between a favorable manager and an unfavorable manager. So whether the team thought that the manager was, was good or not. And the area that it had the greatest impact was if you had an unfavorable manager, your curiosity was 22 points lower than if you had a favorable one a curious culture is a game changer what does curiosity mean for you follow hashtag curious advantage and join the conversation i'm fascinated by your, your a and b players you talk about trying to get the b players to become a players presumably continuing to motivate the a players uh, to continue to be curious i think this is one of the main tenets of uh, our research in our book is that people can become better at being curious, you know, almost if curiosity was a muscle that you could work out. How would you see people becoming more curious? Can, is it something that you see that people do get better at? And, and if so, how are they doing that themselves at a personal level? You're not an A player for life and you're not a B player for life. It also has to do with the environment. If you, it's, it's, it's maybe linking a little bit to... Uh, to the concept of flow. If you're professionally in the longer term flow, then the chances for you to be an A player are, are big. But suddenly if you change your role um, or if something happens to you professionally, otherwise you might become a B player because the environment is kind of changing around you. I see a lot of organizations that have a lot of hurdles and they create, some organizations create a lot of enablers, but there's also disablers. Um, whether you have a rotation policy, yes or no, whether um, learning or training is more lip service than, than, than anything else, whether, like we said earlier, if the manager is casting a ne negative shadow over the people, then there's all kinds of possibilities where the organization can, uh, can support or not the, the general curiosity of people. Like general meta skills, uh, I think mind mindfulness is very powerful there. Self-awareness. Um, intensive self-reflection, and very often people say, oh, never thought of that. I've been always looking outside, but I've never looked inside. And I think the more you understand yourself, the more you're in tune with yourself, including your limiting beliefs. So it's, I, I think it's a long answer to a very difficult question, but I think we as humans have that flexibility to, to change so even learning is becoming more and more science-based, as I'm as database, but really down to the philosophy and psychology around it. Yeah, these seem to be some of this broadening out into multiple disciplines. I think it's still too much intuition-based because I learn this way. I'm going to make sure that everybody has to learn that way, and every every individual is different. Every individual is different, and it, um, it's a lovely segue into a question I'd like to ask you: is What makes you personally most curious? My, my big dream is to start a, to start a bachelor in philosophy now as a, as a next stage. I've been reading lots in philosophy, but I've also read on, on positive psychology and I read about anthropology and I'm trying to read as, as broadly as I can. But I wanted to take this time out now uh, and maybe celebrate my curiosity and going deep into this uh, into philosophy. I've been, I've been, probably I've been never very happy with status quo. I'm more of a change person. Um, I've looked at learning and development at, at, and also all the different jobs I had, always from the lens of a business person, trying to use learning as a tool. Um, and status quo is, is always something to watch out for. Uh, and that drive, probably drove my curiosity, sense of curiosity. How, how can we always turn the pages around? How can we turn things do things better, never take things for granted. And that was for me. Um... So to wrap things up, um, what would be the one thing from the conversation today you think or from your views on curiosity for our, for our listeners to take away if you had to, to sum up in one point? 
Well, I think curiosity is here to stay, especially now, especially when the future is more and more unknown. In the 1960s, we knew what the 1970s was going to look like. Now in 2020, we don't know what 2030 is going to look like. So curiosity is one of the, maybe even the biggest ingredients to drive this. And everybody is going to listen to this, this need to come to grips with this notion for him or herself. What is curiosity for me? And um, I'd say, I'd say good luck and start exploring and start reinventing yourselves and you'll see what magic is to be found. Couldn't conclude better than that. So thank you so much for joining us, Stefan. It's been great having you on the show. Thank you, Stefan. Thank you so much for having me. You've been listening to a Curious Advantage podcast. Buy the Curious Advantage book now on Amazon and learn about the seven C's model for being more curious and join the conversation at hashtag Curious Advantage. Subscribe today and keep exploring curiously. See you next time. This podcast is produced by Aliki Palinelli and John McGinty and edited by Jill Damatak-Futter.